If there's one thing both boots on the ground and generals in the Pentagon worry about with the same fervor, it's the rapid evolution of cheap, deadly drones that can now dominate a battlefield. As leaders and innovators grapple with both how to defend against those swarms and employ their own version of the capability, experts are working on how the U.S. can keep up. For a conversation on the topic, Defense News' Jen Judson sat down with a pair of leaders to hear their latest thinking. Here's some of their conversation. Talk a little bit about some of the, the hurdles and challenges that are getting in the way of U.S. defense being able to adopt attributable drones in mass, manufacture them quickly, they're cheap. And what are some of the things that, you know, in Ukraine, for instance, they're able to manufacture tons and they're supplying them from all over the place. What are some of the things that they don't have to adhere to that maybe, you know, are roadblocks for us? There's a very important psychological effect here, and that is United States has very expensive but excellent systems that no one else has, and we can build them out to any capability, but they are going to be expensive, and losing that expensive platform in a test, in evaluation, uh, in, in a test run um, is scary for a lot of units, unit commanders, or even developers themselves. In some of the articles we're getting right now about Army testing and evaluation of um, certain drone technologies based on the war in Ukraine, the issue is we don't have enough small tactical drones. Those that we do have tend to be relatively expensive. So again, losing that system has consequences. Uh, and a paper trail and so on and so forth. That's not the case in Ukraine. A drone is used, is lost, it is replaced again, again, and again, and again. I was just a battalion commander. Um, if we lose a system, we're virtually launching the trap. I, I'm, I'm sure there's people standing around the audience right now, like if, if a Puma goes down in Iraq or Afghanistan, you launch the trap because it was on your CMR, right? Like, that's, that's not the case. Like, I was signed for that. And um, <clears throat> it's, it's also how we're building things, and it's some of what we're, uh, what we're putting on ourselves. So there are certain levels of systems that we're procuring that are NAMP compliant, like an F-18. <clears throat> the price point for one of the cheaper systems, at least for the Marine Corps, for a quadcopter is around 41K. The price point for a FPV system that can reasonably take out a T90 with a good pilot is between six and $800 on the high side. So that's a, that's a, huge, that's a huge shift, and, and, and Sam hit it. it. It's both a cultural thing, and it's a both what, what we have a super, super mature Air Force, and what effect does that have, and, and, and how does that culture of how we tend towards those larger programs, um, how does that bleed into this space, which is taking the back seat um, for a long, long time, really since 1918 when the first Kettering bug flew over the trench to solve the same operational problem. It's, it's, they've, they've been around forever. Um, integrating them and not deconflicting them, that's, uh, you know, that, that, that's going to start here just as much as it starts on how you budget for them. What are some things that you're seeing from industry in terms of adapting to this idea of being able to mass produce on the cheap drones um, so that the, you know, the U.S. forces have you know, capability in mass, which is what they really need? Certainly at AUSA, if you walk around, you see a lot more smaller tactical systems. You see a lot more systems which are cheaper uh, in the tens of thousands of dollars fulfilling maybe the same mission requirement as the ones in Ukraine combat at a few hundred dollars, but still uh, going from a million dollars to just a few tens of thousands of dollars is relatively cheap for the United States military. So you see a lot more of these type of systems at this specific forum. And you also, uh, if you talk to a lot of vendors, if you talk to developers, those who exhibit, and you ask, have you actually tried the system out in Ukraine? Are you going to do that? Do you, are you building a relationship with someone in Ukraine so you can try it out in combat? And the answer tends to be yes or maybe, which is, again, a major shift. When you start tying demands from industry to the way the military fights, um, and... <clears throat> You hear a lot of pushback on, from, from two different sides. On the one side, you'll hear there's no requirement for that. No one's went, written the requirement for that. Um, and then the real bureaucratic insurgents uh, will say something like there's no task for that. That's internal to the service. There is no task that is reportable 
through DERS that compels today a commander to integrate at scale the number of systems to alter the way that our doctrine is used. 